Good morning. I'd like to extend a special welcome to our uh, applicants for general surgery residency who are taking a hard look at the program. We're going to give you a good look around today and it sounds like you're going to have some fun. Uh, and it's my pleasure this morning to introduce Dr. Nick Nash. Dr. Nash went to Trinity High School and attended Transylvania University for going to the University of Louisville School of Medicine, where we were fortunate to recruit him to the residency program in general surgery. He did his fellowship in trauma critical care at University of Southern California. And he's been a spectacular faculty member for many years now where he's uh, contributed in many, many ways. He's a very, very busy and skilled trauma and acute care surgeon. You get to work with him all the time. Uh, he's uh, widely published and he's uh, a, an award-winning educator, as you'll see here in a minute. And, uh, he's always has a upbeat attitude and he's fun to work with. Nick, you do everything well and we're happy to have you here. And thanks for giving grand rounds. All right, thank you, sir. Uh, and I also want to extend that welcome to the uh, applicants. It's a really exciting time. Y'all are getting ready to uh, embark on an incredible journey. And uh, again, hopefully we can uh, lure you all some here today. Hopefully Dr. Vitale's was uh, fun last night. Unfortunately, I had to take my daughter to swim practice, which was a lot of fun watching my five-year-old not drown. So uh, uh, she's, she's doing great actually. But uh, anyway, again, welcome. And uh, I don't know if uh, for the applicants, any Bon Jovi people, Heard of them, listened to them before. Some okay, good. I don't feel so so old, but anyway, try to come up with a catchy title today, and y'all could tell me at the end if you think it works. Uh, no financial disclosures at all uh, to discuss with y'all, but uh, everything that we're going to present today really has an explicit bias towards Louisville. Uh, I love this place. Uh, born and raised here, um, just am lucky to be back here on faculty. Uh, I think we just we just incredibly lucky to have this job. Uh, this famous, of course, Muhammad Ali, born Cassius Clay here in Old General Hospital, which is the administrative uh, building just down the street. Uh, one of the most famous sports figures uh, of all time and one of the most recognizable faces throughout the world. Uh, the Muhammad Ali Center is fantastic. Again, hopefully the applicants, y'all get a little chance to, to go around Louisville today. It's a beautiful building uh, built in his honor. Cards, uh, of course, I'm a huge Cards fan. If y'all want to go to the Yum Center tomorrow, oftentimes called the Chicken Bucket. Uh, we, we got plenty of tickets available because our basketball team's a little bit rough right now. Um, so please come on. It's a beautiful facility, at least. Uh, so come on out tomorrow. Of course, uh, Churchill Downs. Uh, my wife's a thoroughbred veterinarian. Of course, Dr. Polk and uh, formerly Dr. Richardson, uh, huge thoroughbred people. We're, it's a huge thoroughbred country. Most exciting two minutes in sports. Uh, the second largest sporting single-day sporting event in the United States, only to the Indianapolis 500. So well worth your time to come down here first Saturday in May. And finally, of course, bourbon. Uh, hopefully, y'all get to, uh, again, peruse around downtown. Um, I highly recommend the old Forrester uh, uh, bourbon tour. It's a beautiful building, state of the art. Um, you can actually see them char uh, barrels. Usually, you don't get to see them char bourbon barrels because you don't want to have fire next to where alcohol is. But anyway, it's a beautiful facility. Um, I highly recommend going down there. And it's, it's pretty cool to watch the process to take you through it all. I want to start first about some of the the, the names you're going to see throughout uh, your tours today. Uh, you know, th these people's legacies uh, are huge, and, and of course, we've honored them with uh, naming some buildings and, and, and stuff after them. Uh, the person on your left there is this is a picture that that uh, hangs in my office. Uh, two of my favorite mentors, and really the reason I went into doing all this stuff, and several of the faculty uh, in, in the trauma department. On your left is Dr. Frank Miller. This was taken in 1998. I love this picture of them. Uh, Pat Hunt, his longtime uh, partner, uh, gave me this. Um, uh, Frank Miller was a master surgeon here. The residents don't probably realize it, but they walk under his name every single day on the way into the OR because uh, they named the surgical suites after him in his honor. Uh, he was actually a master surgeon. He's the guy that we called if we had any problems, concerns, situations. We, we couldn't work through something. He would show up night or day. Um, he was a master educator. He won more teaching awards here at the, uh, at the medical school. They eventually took the title away from him. They wouldn't even let him win it anymore because they were sick of giving it to him and named it after him uh, in his honor as well. So just a wonderful person. You'll see his again, name throughout the department. To his, uh, to his uh, left and your all's right, Dr. J. David Richardson. 
uh, who passed away in 2021. Uh, again, a lot of y'all have probably heard of him. His name will be on the side of the hospital when everything's said and done. They named the trauma center after him in the library, of course, upstairs that you guys will hang out in today. It's named in his honor. Um, just a, a, a larger than life personality, uh, extremely well published, 375 uh, articles, uh, multiple book chapters and books, uh, et cetera. He gave over 100 named lectures throughout his career all over the world. Um, and it was the 96th president of American College of Surgeons. So again, just a big part of the legacy here uh, in the department. And these two men have been leading this place for the last 54 years, which having that kind of stability and leadership, as you guys will go see other programs, is a really, really big deal. Uh, Dr. Polk is one of the longest serving chairman. Uh, uh, it took over in 1971. Um, again, incredibly well published. He is the reason that the nurses call y'all every morning to uh, get the antibiotic order prior to cutting skin, right? He is the reason we give preoperative antibiotics to uh, decrease surgical site infections. And of course, did a lot of work on melanoma. And luckily for us, Dr. McMasters took over uh, afterwards. Uh, has been uh, chair of the department here since 2005. That means he's got to go for another 15 years to make it to 2040, which I think he can do, hopefully. Uh, again, incredibly well published, uh, past president of the Southern Surgical, Western Surgical, uh, Society of Surgical Oncology, current editor in chief. Oh, I can't say everything. Uh, the analyst of uh, surgical oncology, and it was a principal investigator in a melanoma trial, which at the time was the, the largest melanoma trial in the world. Um, I, I always want to make sure the applicants really know, you know, the type of leaders and, and the type of people that are here. Um, and I point you to, you know, you get on YouTube later on today and, and really watch these two speeches that Dr. McMaster's gave. They are incredible. His Western Surgical speech in 2017 and his uh, Society of Surgical Oncology speech in 2018. You'll kind of see the type of person that, that helps leave this place is special. Uh, and again, we're lucky to get to come in here and, and, and work with them every day. Um, it, it, the, the life lessons in there are great. And, and again, what you'll, what you'll find is this place is all about education. I think the residents will tell you all that throughout this, this morning. Uh, you know, we love to teach here. So again, just you can watch those later today, both about 30 minutes a piece. All right, so let's go ahead and get into clinical stuff. Um, one of my favorite things to talk about, of course, is, is shock being a trauma person. We're not going to talk a ton about hemorrhage today. We're really going to talk about uh, the causes of obstructive shock and go through those uh, in detail. And of course, touch on a little bit of ATLS. So first, uh, good to always start with the definition. Uh, shock is known as an inadequate you know, in the simplest form, the inadequate oxygen delivery leading to metabolic collapse. So it really is a supply and demand problem. Uh, you know, when the body shuts, the body starts shutting down when oxygen's not there to, and, and nutrients and substrates aren't there to supply it and shock ensues. And, and most commonly, you'll see that uh, from a vital signs in global perspective as hypotension, right? But it comes in a lot of shapes and sizes. There's all different kinds of ways to, uh, to calculate this. But again, normally you'll see, hey, we've got drop in blood pressure. Obviously, we have a very sick patient here. Um, as critical care fellows, we'll soon find out this is all over the critical care boards, the oxygen delivery equation. It's not important that you know every little thing until you actually take the test, obviously. But it is important to know the components of it, right? So to get oxygen and tissue, you've got to have cardiac output, of course, so the heart pumping it through. And then all the other things are just how the oxygen is, is uh, concentrated in the body. And again, the main drivers are hemoglobin and O2 sats. The PO2, uh, which we try to drive up with all the fancy things we do, especially in the RDS, doesn't, and you can see it's multiplied by a very small number. So it doesn't have a huge bearing on uh, actual oxygen delivery. That's why when you try to increase it just a little bit, it doesn't help that much uh, systemically. All right, so four main causes of shock. And again, uh, for the students, uh, you know, you all and the junior residents, of course, you guys will come to know this very well. So four main reasons why people are sick. Uh, and again, most commonly for us in the trauma situation is the hemorrhagic or hypovolemic shock. Number two is cardiogenic shock when the pump fails. Three is distributive shock or, or vasodilatory shock. A lot of different reasons for this, sepsis, neurogenic uh, adrenal insufficiency, et cetera. And finally, obstructive shock. And that's where we're going to spend the majority of our uh, uh, time today. You can touch a little bit on hemorrhage. As I'll tell you, in trauma, cardiogenic and, and uh, distributive shock are really diagnosis of exclusion. So you want to rule all the other things out first before you hang your hat that those are the problems. Uh, this is interesting. So ATLS was started in the late 1970s, and this is uh, one of the best ways to kind of uh, work through these situations in our trauma patients quickly, uh, kind of creates a checklist manifesto. So you make sure you're not missing anything uh, for reversible causes of the shock. Uh, this is Dr. James Steiner. He's actually an orthopedic surgeon uh, that came up with ATLS. Uh, he was in a car, or excuse me, a, a plane crash when he was flying his family back 
uh, from Los Angeles. That's in Nebraska. Yes, that's pretty cool that he got to fly his own plane. But anyway, crashed the plane and he was uh, horrified at the lack of standardization that happened uh, of taking care of his family. Nobody, you know, half of them were, were on a, a, a board. Some of them have seat collars, some of them didn't. And so he, uh, after that experience, he, he spent the rest of his life, you know, developing this and, and, uh, and verifying it. And it's, it's pretty awesome. Again, nice and simple. Uh, cause you don't want to do a whole lot of thinking when you're in there in the trauma bay, you just want to kind of react to patterns, right? That's our whole job. And so, um, what you will see, you know, of course, the ABCDE is the, uh, the, uh, primary survey, airway, breathing, circulation, disability, and exposure environment. And you're going to go this over and over and over again on your trauma patients. Um, uh, what happens is in the, in the trauma bay, most of us, you know, this is all done at the same time. It's kind of done quickly. Uh, as you're assessing the person the first two to three minutes. But you all as the residents, uh, and of course, us as the staff, you know, you want to make sure this is each one of these is getting checked off because if you skip to the, you know, disability exposure part, you're going to miss something earlier on. So really, really important to always go through this list uh, and make sure these are being checked off. And there's always adjuncts to the primary survey. And th these are really to help you, again, quickly delineate what type of shock the patient is in. Um, always recommend putting on in a Foley, uh, of course, an NG2 for uh, gastric decompression. And uh, the Hertz or the uh, FAST exam, which is the focused uh, assessment for sonography for trauma, has been a huge uh, upgrade to being able to quickly diagnose, especially intra-abdominal hemorrhage uh, in our patients. And of course, the, the other adjuncts are a chest x-ray and a pelvic x-ray. And if you do these things to every single trauma patient that comes in, you're going to quickly be able to realize you know, where the patient's bleeding uh, or if they have an obstructive phenomenon that's, that's causing their shock. And that, and that says that here again. Quickly want to uh, uh, allow you to evaluate uh, reversible causes. Um, for the students and, and juniors, uh, again, takes about a liter and a half of blood to drop to first drop your systolic pressure. So obviously we're high, quite a bit behind the eight ball when that happens. That's thirty percent of your total circulating volume. There's five overall places that that can happen. So again, when these trauma patients come in, you're going to quickly go through where is a liter and a half of, of blood gone. So uh, first, you want to make sure that it's not on the floor, right? So scalp. Uh, scalp lax and, and blood at the scene, all these kinds of things. Again, a person can come in, they're no longer bleeding because the blood pressure is so low, but the EMS provider like, well, there was a ton of blood at the scene. So again, the floor is one place, obviously, that they can lose it. Uh, chest is the next. And again, we quickly get a chest x-ray to rule that out as a possible cause. The abdomen, again, very, very common place for us uh, to go looking. Uh, the FAST scan is extremely uh, sensitive and specific for that. Uh, only takes about 150 cc's of blood in the abdomen to make that uh, fast positive. So y'all want to be very, very fast. So again, ER, most of our ER colleagues start with this, but as residents, we want to be good at doing this as well. Um, BPL, if the fast is equivocal, is another way to quickly test the abdominal cavity as a cause. Again, we don't do these quite as much anymore, but sometimes when the fast is equivocal, we do have to cut down the fashion to just make sure there's no blood in there. The retroperitoneum or pelvis is the next place that that much blood can accumulate. Uh, again, a quick pelvic x-ray is always uh, part of your primary survey uh, and a Foley placement, like we talked about before, that can rule out hematuria, which can, you know, uh, uh, clue you into renal laceration. And finally, long bones. And again, this is one of those things that after you've gone through, chest x-ray is okay, fast is okay. We still got this crazy base deficit on our blood gas, um, and we don't really know where all the blood is. Well, long bones, right, can, can, can accumulate quite a bit of blood. So each femur, we usually uh, say about a liter, humerus, the same way. So uh, those could be a, a substantial reason for blood loss. Um, as we talked about, and we'll go through the rest of the lecture, uh, effective shock, chest x ray, fast are really the main tenets for those. And finally, distributed, like I was telling before, uh, neurogenic shock is a problem in our patients, usually with a, a C spine or high T spine injury that has severed the sympathetic uh, cord to the heart. Uh, and it can be a cause, but it always a diagnosis of exclusion. So for us, it's always hemorrhage, 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 then obstructive shock, uh, and then everything else. So uh, again, getting the causes overall uh, of obstructive shock, uh, start with rib fractures, very common uh, diagnosis. And of course that can lead to uh, attention pneumothorax affects over 350,000 people a year. Uh, and if you look at U of L's numbers, we're actually outside of the, a lot higher than the national average, almost a third of our patients uh, uh, come with rib fractures. So it's a big problem. Uh, the cost of annual increase, and that's for a lot of different reasons, incidence has gone up as the population has aged, as well as of course inflation. Uh, and so it's an expensive endeavor. Um, it's, it's, it has a high association with uh, extrathoracic injury as well. Somewhere around 80, 85% of patients have other injuries, whether it's a, a broken extremity, head injury, et cetera. So keep that in mind. 
Uh, mortality is variable, depends on the patient and other, other comorbidities. But uh, one of the better papers written on this was uh, early on 2005. Uh, they looked at the National Trauma Data Bank numbers and really tried to assess, you know, each rib fracture and how much more uh, it can contribute to mortality. So again, uh, it's a real number, especially uh, in the elderly. So you want to treat them with respect and the residents know that when these patients come in uh, and you tell them right away, hey, we need you to cooperate with us a lot, pulmonary toilet and that thing's what we're going to go over. But uh, you guys got to contribute to your care because it can it can kill you. Um, and as we talked about before, age matters. Uh, any, any patient over 65 uh, has a higher risk of, uh, you know, need a ventilator, pneumonia, et cetera. As far as diagnosis, you know, usually this is pretty straightforward, luckily. Uh, you know, the old adage of uh, look, listen, and feel from a physical exam perspective. You really uh, want to be trying to palpate for crepitus sub-Q air because it might channel you into putting in uh, chest tubes earlier. And, and flail chest is also a big deal. If you clinically see that, that paradoxical movement, uh, so basically when a patient has broken ribs in multiple places uh, on the same side, that basically the, the, the chest cavity can collapse on itself when the patient takes a big breath. Uh, and that is always a harbinger of, uh, of badness, and, and you want to uh, treat that with respect. Uh, as far as chest size are concerned, um, what the residents have learned, especially early on in their careers, is, is we basically become uh, pretty good radiologists uh, through this. You need to look at all your films. And again, I'm always you want to be very systematic about looking at chest x-rays. I use the ABCDEF method, uh, airway, right? Want to make sure the trachea is midline. Here, I get my pointer. You want to make sure the trachea is midline, uh, breathing. You're going to look at the lung parenchyma. You guys can see there's some uh, hyperdensities here, probably pulmonary contusion in the life, not a significant in the thorax. Circulation, look at the heart, making sure there's not a wide mediastinum. D is for diaphragm, you know, making sure that the right is a little bit higher than the left and there's no major injury. E is for envelope, looking at all the bony envelope, clavicles, sternocolicular junction, ribs, of course, are broken there. Uh, which is what I was going for, uh, and F is foreign body, right? So usually we're worried most about gunshot wounds, foreign bodies, but there's a lot of other foreign bodies. This gives you, right, all these external wires here. You can tell this person has likely has a lot of comorbidities, may have had a cabbage about, who knows. Uh, but again, we're going to be really syst uh, systematic about your chest x-rays. Uh, the extended FAST scan, so you can use sonogram to help you diagnose uh, pneumothoraces and, and whatnot. I am not great at this. Our ER colleagues are much better. I don't, I don't just go ramming in the chest tube when they say the fast is positive for the pneumothorax if the patient's hemodynamically okay, I wait for the chest x-ray, but you can diagnose it and, and, and do it on that. Um, if patients are hemodynamically stable, they of course next go to the CT scanner for further workup. Uh, and this can really delineate you know, the, the, uh, uh, the danger and the type of, of rib fractures that present. Um, it's really good to get a, a 3D reconstruction on these patients uh, when you have significant damage. To help you try to decide if you're going to uh, perform rib fixation, which we'll talk about. Um, for the residents, they're starting to come up with a lot more uh, scoring systems uh, about the fracture patterns in ribs because we're there's still a lot of debate in the literature about how we should deal with them. Should we just do pain control? Should we just have them cough and deep breathe? Or should we actually sur surgically stabilize these? And that's why these scoring patterns are really becoming uh, more into vogue uh, to try to figure out you know who are the best patients that we should be fixing. Uh, there's a whole lot of them. You'll see the chest abbreviated injury score, which is usually what we use in trauma. Uh, the chest wall society has actually created an even bigger, uh, more robust uh, scoring system. And again, this is correlated um, uh, with uh, pulmonary complications and adverse outcomes. So again, this is still not ready for uh, the big time yet, but know that this is going on behind the scenes to try to help us figure out which patients will, will best benefit uh, from further stabilization. Um, as far as treatment, uh, again, this is something you guys are going to be dealing with all the time. The mainstay is really pain control. Uh, and since the opioid epidemic, I think we've actually gotten so much better uh, at doing this, this idea of multimodal uh, analgesia. And again, the residents are fantastic, way better at the, at the, old, people than, uh, at the old people than this. Um, we, uh, again, start right away with using non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, whether it's IV toradol. Uh, uh, Ketorolac or uh, ibuprofen, uh, acetaminophen right away. Again, we can even give IV formulations of this. Uh, all these are great anti-inflammatory and, and really do a great job of uh, controlling their pain. Uh, muscle relaxants are huge as well. Baclofen uh, and Flexeril being the most common. Um, alpha-2 agonists such as clonidine and Presidex can be beneficial. Gabapentin is huge. Again, starting these patients right away uh, on Neurontin uh, can have a, a lot of benefits. Um, and topical, right? So lidocaine patches uh, are also very, very helpful. 
Um, as you bump up uh, and the patient's still not doing well from a pain perspective, opioids are what we use next. Uh, and again, you want to be very specific on when the nurses are supposed to be applying these. So you want to be very good about doing your pain scores uh, uh, so you know, so the nurses know exactly how much to deliver and when. Um, you could also use patient control analgesia, the PCAs. Uh, it's a nice adjunct uh, to your other anti-inflammatories. Um, I put epidurals and, and uh, the nerve and the intercostal nerve blocks here, which of course you have to have the pain team for. You know, when you look through the data, uh, there's not there's actually not great data on rib fractures in these. And it's and I, I spoke with some of our own pain doctors here. The problem is most of the epidurals aren't placed high enough for these to be uh, uh, very useful in chest trauma. So they usually do at the, ten, the, the T10 or T10, T11 level. And of course, that only affects the lower ribs. So that's why there's a lot of problems with trying to do um, uh, epidural anesthesia and the nerve blocks really just don't work that well. So keep that in mind. We always get them involved. We try to get them involved to help prevent it, uh, intubation, et cetera. But they really just don't work that well in the long term. And chronicity is another big part of this, right? So the rib cage is always moving. Uh, it's, it takes a long time for these ribs to heal. And a lot of these patients don't get back to their normal lives for quite a while. So it's important to uh, educate the patients on, on that fact. Um, this is just a, a J trauma or a journal trauma um, uh, paper, uh, basically a meta-analysis looking at all the different ways uh, that we treat rib fractures. And they basically gave four recommendations. The first is talking about ICU admission. Um, and again, there's no one size fits all for these. Uh, I, as a resident, know, I always err on the side of caution, especially in the elderly, um, about just admitting to the ICU. But know, know that we're wrong at least 10% of the time. So 10% of the time, the, the patients will be upgraded. Uh, so again, at least put these patients on, most of these patients on a monitor, unless people are fantastic and don't have any other issues. Um, other, other reasons to be worried, uh, hypoxemia on, on room air, uh, you know, significant uh, chest injury score, uh, smoking history and frailty. Uh, as far as symptom spirometer, uh, really important, I think, for the residents to go in the room every day and make sure the patient takes a big, deep breath uh, in some objective way. And, and, that, and the best way to do that for us is in symptom spirometer. Really, really cheap. Um, obviously, it's safe and there could be some benefits. So again, not great studies uh, to show you one way or the other, but any kind of therapy is, is cheap and possibly effective. It, it's probably worth doing. Um, know that the break that the break point, the inflection point of when patients usually have more problems is about 750 cc. So if they can't pull that much, again, you may want to bump them up from a, a monitoring perspective. Uh, Non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. Again, the, the the guidelines really say you know to use this sparingly. Sometimes you know we'll put our patients, especially the COPDers, uh, on some BiPAP uh, to try to help uh, stem the tide of, of getting our pain medicine and, and things working. So we don't have to immediately innovate them because we know they're going to be difficult to take off of the ventilator. Uh, but, it, but again, don't use this for a real extended amount of time, right? You know, it's really a six to 12 hour therapy in my mind, trying to get them comfortable first uh, and then get them off of it because it does cause gastric distension and has this other problem. So uh, again, you know, it's just a little bit of a rescue therapy. Don't, don't have it be the end all be all. And again, at the end of the day, multimodal analgesia is really the way to go for ribs. As far as operative fixation goes, uh, this was largely abandoned. This, this used to be a, a, a practice in the, in the 30s and 40s, largely abandoned after the 1950s because of uh, the onset of positive pressure ventilation, right? So the polio epidemic came on, ventilators became a thing, and, and basically they would just innovate people and let them heal over time, which is sometimes what we do now. Uh, this has really come back into vogue over the last 15 years in an effort to try to restore uh, chest wall integrity. And it makes sense, right? Especially in the flail chest patients when their chest is all caved in. If you can reestablish uh, structure to the chest wall and allow the lung to fully expand, uh, patients technically should do better. Um, there's a lot of different uh, uh, operative techniques. We usually use the anterior fixation system. Uh, Y'all can see here, uh, these are the kind of the plates that, that can be put in the place. You can use a lot of different types of incisions to get to the ribs and, and, and the fractures that are there. You can see the fracture stabilized here uh, and then you drill into the bone and then place the, the screws uh, accordingly. So um, it's a pretty straightforward procedure overall. We don't do a ton of them here at U of L. We're pretty selective. I actually had Samantha pull our numbers. Only did about six in 2022 and it was, it was several more than that uh, uh, in 23. Uh, so again, we're pretty, we use it pretty sparingly here and mainly in crush injuries to the chest. At a lot of their hospital and trauma facilities, they're using this probably way too much. Uh, and that's what I kind of wanted to talk about. So um, the overall indications, if you look at the literature, it's pretty sparse about who we should be and shouldn't be uh, 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 fixing. Um, again, mainly retro small retrospective studies, uh, no clear answers from that. 
Um, I do like this study recently published uh, in the Annals of Surgery in 2023. Uh, basically, the authors tried to look at uh, so they they just said, okay, well, we think that the clinical flail chest patients, you know, most likely they they do uh, benefit from having rib fixation. But what about those patients that either have a radiographic flail, meaning they've broken two ribs in two different spots, um, or they've had five consecutive rib fractures or significant by cortical displacement with one rib fracture. And they excluded basically all the clinical flail patients, right? Because they said that, that, that obviously they would benefit. So again, they're trying to figure out the perfect uh, patient to, to play. At the end of the day, they actually had longer length of stays in the surgical fixation group, uh, and they required more pain medicine and had a worse one-month outcome. So again, we use this sparingly here and, and probably appropriately so, uh, but you'll see this a ton about written literature, and it's probably overused in, in other facilities. As far as pneumothoraces are concerned, uh, again, very common pathology that the residents treat on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, about 20% of our trauma, uh, thoracic trauma patients will develop these. Tension is obviously the worst, uh, and that's when you know you kink off the uh, filling of the heart from the vena cava, uh, and you'll get demise without uh, uh, decompression. Um, the residents, you know, again, we usually any any smaller pneumothoraces. A lot of times, we can watch those. So they don't necessarily need a chest tube. And again, 20% of the total surface area is really the cutoff. Um, we, we will put tubes in people that have small pneumothoraces that we know are going to go for other interventions, whether it's, uh, you know, have a orthopedic surgery uh, procedure, because we know they're going to go under positive pressure ventilation, and that might worsen the pneumothorax and people not be ready. So again, sometimes we will empirically treat these, even the smaller ones, to ensure they don't become a problem later. Uh, we always put people on oxygen. It hasn't been much benefit, you know, uh, real proof of, of, of increasing their oxygen tension. Uh, but no, that's a thing. And again, always important to remember, I see so many times uh, uh, the residents, you know, they won't prep. Everybody gets all hyped up because we're doing a procedure and we're trying to save the patient's life. You know, spend a little extra time, put some beta down on the chest, use some local, et cetera, uh, use sharp dissection and, and put the thing in the right spot because uh, it's, it's obviously important uh, from, a, from a place of perspective. Um, we also should give paraprocedural antibiotics for these. We oftentimes don't, but if you look at most of the guidelines, it does decrease uh, some infectious concerns. So um, if they can, you know, get in some antibiotics prior to it, it's usually a good policy. As far as hematoraces are concerned, this is when blood accumulates in the portal space. It usually takes about 200, 300 cc's for that to uh, show up on a chest x-ray. You can see massive hematorax here from, from rib fractures. Uh, prompt evacuation, of course, is necessary. Um, really important to get a follow-up chest x-ray as soon as you put the tube in to ensure that the hematorax has been completely decompressed. Uh, obviously, most of our patients will go for CTs after if they remain hemodynamically normal. If they don't, uh, sometimes we have to do an emergent thoracotomy, right, for that. And the, the, the age-old um, uh, guidelines for that typically are more than a liter out at a time or, or greater than 200 over four hours. Just know that, that that's kind of surgical dogma and that really has been proven. Um, I think it's more important to pay attention to the patient's hemodynamics uh, and their base deficit at the time, right? So um, I think sometimes we are a little we are a little gun shy on taking these patients to the operating room because 85 percent of the patients that we treat with chest trauma will get better with just a chest tube. But if the patient still isn't acting right, you rule out all the other causes from the from the abdomen, et cetera, uh, and they're still hypotensive. Again, most of the time they, they need a chest exploration to figure out what's going on and, and to stop the bleeding. Uh, this is a, a review done by our own institution, Dr. Benz and, and company. Uh, uh, looking at does, ch does the chest tube location matter for secondary interventions? Uh, again, it's a, a cool little study. Basically, um, looked at the patients that came in, got a chest tube in our trauma bay, and then moved on to uh, to CT scanner. Um, and basically, wanted to see, you know, if you put it too far forward, is it a problem? If you put it too far back or too high? Uh, and again, sorry, for us, uh, if you look at our numbers. Uh, shockingly enough that most of them are in a perfect position. You know, the third of them at least are in, a, are in the right position in the six intercostal space. That's pretty low. So, uh, but uh, at the end of the day, that is absolutely perfect from a drainage perspective for, for most of it. So, uh, so that's a good thing. Now, yeah, unfortunately you can't, I don't know how to move this thing, but 1% um, of the pay, uh, were more extra thoracic, right? So either intra-abdominal or in sub-Q space. So really, really, really important to be uh, proficient at doing this procedure because it saves lives but you want to make sure the tube's in the right spot. So uh, again, when the juniors are first starting out and haven't done a lot of procedures, the PGY3s, even PGY5s, you know, make sure they're in the right spot uh, before the tube is placed. Very, very, very important because you don't want to be extra thoracic. 
Uh, further further uh, points from, from Dr. Benz's study, uh, we used to use a lot bigger chest tubes here, right? So 87% of the patients probably had a, you know, had a garden hose going through there, 32 French, 36 French. There's even about 5%, Dr. Harbreck would be proud, 40 French chest tubes. So uh, that's a big, that's a big tube. Uh, so uh, again, and I'll show a study after this, you know, smaller tubes work just as good as the bigger. So keep it, be aware of that. Um, and, and again, the take home point from this study, high chest tubes weren't a significant risk factor uh, in placement. So at the end of the day, just get the tube in, uh, be careful with how low you place it. Usually we shoot for the inframammary fold uh, and, and again, usually the mid axillary line. Okay, that, that's the ideal setting. Uh, and this is the, I don't know how to get rid of this other thing too. Let's see if I can. It's gonna be. You said okay, I think. Okay. Um, so this is Dr. Kijinaba. This is at USC where some of my former mentors there uh, did, a, did a cool little study, basically, you know, prospectively following patients. If we put a smaller tube in, does it matter from secondary interventions? And it absolutely doesn't at all. Um, this is just showing that the groups are the same. Uh, and again, there's no difference. I'm not sure I can get this thing. There's absolutely no difference in. I won't leave uh, in interventions, uh, secondary interventions overall. So again, normally nowadays we put in a 28 French chest tube towards intercostal space mid X-ray line. Um, great study again from our own institution, Dr. Smith and colleagues uh, looking at that. So this is what I was telling you about and, and the residents already know this. As soon as we get uh, put in chest tubes and, um, uh, and the chest X-ray just isn't clearing up, it's really important to get early CTs in these patients within the first 48 to 72 hours. So you know whether you need to do further surgical intervention on them. Uh, early VATs are a whole lot of these video assisted thoracoscopies. They're a whole lot simpler when the hemothorax hasn't become a fibrothorax. Uh, and you can see from our data, again, about 6% of patients required a VAT uh, after a test tube placement. Uh, and you can see if you get the, the operation done within five days, they have a shorter length of stay, less likelihood of having an empyema uh, and the like. So really important to get those taken care of early because uh, these are a lot harder as they get go on later. All right, next uh, cause of obstructive shock that's really fun to talk about and, and really fun pathology to take care of when you're in the trauma bay. This one gets gets all of our blood flowing pretty well. Uh, it's cardiac tamponade. Uh, again, the presentation can be extremely variable. Uh, patients usually come in tachycardic, diaphoretic, uh, and I always like to talk to the residents about this alter mental status phenomenon. Uh, a lot of our patients obviously, you know, have have drug issues or come in, uh, 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 you know, uh, drunk. Um, these patients look like that, uh, but it's more because their the oxygen of their brain is, is being is being kinked off by, by tamponade. So they will act crazy. I mean, they'll be throwing punches and you'd think that they're on something real, uh, but it's just they're they're getting ready to expire. So uh, be aware of that. It can it can it can be masked. Uh, the Vex triad was was described in 1934 by Claude Beck, who's a cardiothoracic surgeon at Case Western. Um, it's the age-old hypotension, muffled heart sounds, jugular venous distension. It's only present in about 15% of patients uh, that present nowadays. So again, it's not perfect. When all three of them are, are, uh, are present, though, the positive predictive value of that is very high. So they're, they're going to have it. Uh, mechanism is obviously important. Usually we see this with penetrating trauma, but blunt can happen. And again, there's at least two patients in the last 15 years I've been here that have been saved, that had a blunt atrial rupture coded uh, when the patient got here and we're saved with an ED thoracotomy. So uh, again, you know, cardiac tamponade can happen with blunt trauma. It's pretty rare, uh, but don't necessarily write those patients off, especially if they have a positive fast, which we'll, we'll go over. Um, gunshot wounds are becoming a lot more common uh, as causes of this. Uh, again, I think patients get to the hospital a little bit faster than they did in the olden days. You know, the, the ER systems, et cetera, triage systems are, are fantastic. Uh, and even though the weaponry is, is a lot more lethal, um, a lot of these patients do get to us. So it has become more of a problem. Um, as you can see from a surface area perspective, usually the ventricles are, are what are affected. Uh, the right ventricle most commonly because of the rotation of the heart uh, and where it is just behind the sternum. And it's usually the most anterior surface. So it, it's most commonly, but 87% of injuries are either the right or left ventricle. This is a patient I had in California. Um, I'm not sure if you can see the stab wound very well. Um, again, I've just put these pictures from a physical exam perspective. These patients are extremely sweaty, right? Really diaphoretic. Uh, you can see some jugular, some venous distension here. This is actually his, uh, external jugular, obviously, but uh, again, very dilated veins from, from that obstruction happening. Um, you can see the stab wound, not very impressive right there at the costal margin. And we'll see his video later about decompression. It's pretty awesome. Uh, 
So cardiac box, and again, this is right at the lower border uh, of the cardiac box for him. Usually it's uh, uh, commonly described uh, as being from uh, the, the midclavicular line all the way down the costal margin and across. It's important to remember that you can get stabbed in your back, right? So it's really a 3D picture. Uh, the same picture on the back, you can get stabbed in the back and it can still hit the heart. So keep that in mind. It's not just the, the anterior part. Um, fast scan. So again, th that, that ultrasound we've been talking about a whole lot. That's why the residents seem to get very facile at using that. It's a huge diagnostic uh, uh, modality for us uh, nowadays. It's extremely sensitive and specific for pericardial uh, uh, tamponade. So, so keep that in mind. You want to be really good at doing it. Um, the only time that there are false negatives, and again, sometimes it's patient positioning. They can have some sub-Q air. Of course, body habitus, if they're morbidly obese, it can be hard to do these ultrasounds. But the one time that the, that the test will be negative, that can be negative, is when obviously the heart is decompressing into the chest. So if the patient has an associated mass of hemothorax, they may be decompressing their, their tamponade through that. And again, you're going to be operating on these patients because they're going to continue to dump blood in their chest. And you're going to figure it out when you're in the operating room after you do a thoracotomy on that side. Anytime the, the, you're in doubt, so you can't really see well uh, on uh, the ultrasound, but you still have a high index of suspicion that there could be a cardiac injury, you really want to perform a pericardial window. Um, and, and again, these can be difficult uh, doing a sub window. Um, you want to patient the, the, put the patient in steep uh, reverse from Dellenberg because that will shift the heart down as low as it can in the mediastinum. Um, I like to remove the xycloid process so you can just, you know, cut around it and actually just take it off uh, as you're marching down uh, to the pericardium. And again, you really want to uh, bluntly dissect, get the heart border off of the uh, sternum uh, to give you a little bit more room to do your work. Finally, of course, feel for a pulse, stay midline. You can grasp uh, the tissues as you're going, and it's just kind of like getting into the abdominal cavity, right, as you're doing a, a sawn cut down. Just want to gently keep pulling up the structures that are coming towards you and, and, and taking small snips with the mets and bombs. If the heart uh, sac is completely full of blood, it is really, you know, it can be obviously tense and hard to cut through. Sometimes you do have to use a knife to slowly get into that uh, plane, as I'll show you all shortly. And finally, anytime you're having a whole lot of problems up here, because again, we don't do a ton of sub xiphoid windows, uh, you will on your on your cardiothoracic rotations, but uh, in general, anytime you're having issues, just do a quick upper midline. I think it's a little bit easier to get to the heart uh, through the abdomen because we're all a little bit more comfortable with that. Uh, it's really simple. Just grab the diaphragm, cut right in the center uh, until you until you get down to the pericardium. You want to watch it for 10 beats and it's either positive or negative. It's none of this. You know, there's a little bit, you know, pink and it, you know, it's either positive or negative. So if there's blood that comes out in those 10 beats, you know, the, the patient requires a sternotomy to, to, to rule out an injury. Uh, this is a video of an of a ultrasound taken. And again, you can see, oh, sorry, this uh, hypodensity lesion here. And again, that's either fluid or blood. Oh, this is okay. Um, again, you can see this this fluid. Again, always blood. Any, anytime you have uh, hypodense areas on ultrasound, it's fluid or blood. Um, Dr. Masters provided, the, uh, he does a, a great talk on uh, Arnold, Dr. Arnold Griswold, who's a former chair here. Uh, and really, really smart person, just very innovative. He wrote on all kinds of different topics. Uh, and one of the most famous is, is pericardial tamponade that uh, he experienced here. A lot of people in the 30s were stabbed with ice picks. So it's one of the better things actually stabbed with is and still survive because it rather really kinks off when they're uh, when they get a little bit of tamponade. And so he operated on on tons of those. The, the write ups are incredible. Uh, uh, in this 1942 article, he goes through each one of them uh, and their and their uh, hospital course is pretty cool. Um, I don't recommend doing a what I call sternal thoracotomy. It's not fun incision. This this uh, sometimes you have to just to get exposure to what you need to get to. But these are not fun to recreate. So try not to do that unless you have to. Um, again, this the writing in it is incredible. It talks about Bex triad. They used to measure CVP by putting a uh, you know a column of water uh, and, and having the brachial uh, in the antecubital fossa to measure CVP, which again pretty pretty genius at the time. Uh, and this again more pictorials of uh, plug in the hole. Uh, he also talked about apex stitch if you need to move the heart around, uh, which I don't think is too helpful. You can use a non-crushing clamp or or, or latch to help elevate the heart. As far as special considerations, um, where to innovate is a big one. And so again, anytime you fast scan and 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 rule that the patient has a, a likely uh, cardiac tamponade, you really want to start getting the patient towards the operating room. You kind of want to get the ER doctors away from them and say we want to get this patient upstairs so, so we can deal with them now know that that takes about five minutes, right? So it's not instantaneous. Our ORs are on the second floor. And again, you need to know where your ORs are at your own institutions. But 
Um, it takes about five minutes to get the patient up to the OR, get them on the OR table, prep them and, and get going. But it's important to know that as soon as you induce them, right, they're going to vasodilate and possibly completely drop their pressure in code. So doing this in the ER, again, if you have to do a ER thoracotomy, which is okay, uh, just know that you want to try to get them upstairs if you think that they can make the, the trip, okay? And that is hard to guess sometimes, but at the end of the day, I really just try to get everybody off the patient. Let's go upstairs and, and, and get the heart decompressed because it's nicer to do it in the OR where you got lights and, and, and the appropriate uh, instrumentation. And that's what I was talking about here, e-thoracotomy, sternotomy, or anterior lateral thoracotomy. The other thing that'll happen to you is you'll get the patient, you'll get, get them over the gurney, and then they'll code before you can you know, start trying to do your sternotomy. And most of us can get to the chest, get, get into the chest the fastest by doing anterior lateral thoracotomy, even though that might not be the best exposure for what you're doing. You can crop, go across the sternum and do a complete clamshell if you need to. Uh, but again, it's nicest if you can get the chest prepped out and get going as soon as anesthesia starts doing their thing. So you can go on with the sternotomy because it's a lot easier to fix things with the heart with the sternotomy. Uh, whether you should use pledges or not, I think that they're cumbersome. Uh, and a lot of the techs and things here, because we don't do a lot of heart surgery here, uh, aren't great at using them. So I just like to use uh, 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 3 proline and, and just do a figure of eight stitch. And again, just be careful when you're tying it down. You can rip the heart muscle, but it's pretty hard. The ventricles are usually pretty hardy. Uh, so you're most of the time not going to cause uh, an issue. Uh, intraoperative TE is a great adjunct. Not all anesthesiologists can do this, but if you have a cardiac anesthesiologist, it's wonderful to put a probe down in there. Make sure there's no uh, traumatic septal defect or any other uh, valvular problem with the heart. Uh, and it can also show you whether the patient's immediately aneurysmal after you fix it, right? Because these patients, the, the, your repair sometimes can, uh, uh, can become aneurysmal with time, and it's important to assess that. Um, always important to call for help from our cardiac colleagues. If you're worried about where the stab wound is, or you're thinking that the patient may need bypass to fix this, uh, these injuries. And again, usually they're not going to make it if you have to go into that in depth of problems and you can't just sew up the hole quickly. Uh, but call for help, especially if it's around a coronary. You don't want to tie those off because you can you know, obviously you know, uh, uh, lead to uh, congestive heart failure in those patients and they won't make it. So again, you want to be very, very careful around the coronaries. Um, mediastinal drains, of course, we, we sh you should always leave one, in my opinion, uh, and pull those out, you know, day three or five, three, day three to five, depending. Um, most people don't close the pericardium after these injuries. Uh, I like to close a little bit of it, especially right behind the sternum, just in case the patient needs uh, uh, a sternotomy later in life. These reduced sternotomies are not fun. They have special saws, and, and again, really should be done by cardiac surgeons. Uh, but sometimes that does decrease adhesions a little bit. So I like to close a little bit, leave the top and bottom open. And again, you're going to have mediastinal drain uh, so that the blood really shouldn't reaccumulate. Uh, and finally, really important to get a post-op uh, transthoracic echo. Uh, you want to get one before the patient leaves the hospital and then get one at four to six week follow up because there really is, you know, somewhere around a 15 to 30 percent uh, uh, degradation to aneurysm fr from that repair. So you want to make sure that doesn't happen and hopefully they won't need further surgery from your repair. Uh, this is a video uh, showing the thoracotomy. Uh, again, the patient is obviously arrested. You can do these for a lot of different purposes. Again, we're mainly talking about the focus. I hope that didn't happen the whole time. Uh, so again, you can see they got the fit of cheddar retractor in there. They cut all the way down uh, to the ribs or extending that uh, along the uh, uh, spear uh, margin of the rib. Uh, they decompress the heart here. Um, and again, you extend that all the way, deliver the heart into the wound and start doing manual compressions uh, in patients. You also always, again, they're intubating the patient and putting in a right chest tube. Always put a right chest tube in anytime uh, you are doing any thoracotomy. Uh, to ensure there's no blood on that side. If there's blood, you're going to continue that on along the clamp shell and make sure that there's no something over there you can't put a clamp on to, uh, to help uh, get the patient back. And we usually cross clamp the aorta as well. Again, hopefully that'll restore enough pressure to get the patient up to the operating room. Uh, this is a case we did uh, in California. Hopefully it plays. Yes. Um, this is that stab wound I showed you before. A uh, 20-year-old gentleman that came in, again, stabbed at the costal margin. Um, and he had a, pair, a positive fast, as I showed you. Uh, you can see sternotomy done. Uh, he actually coded right at this point in the operation as they were, as they were getting through the sternum. Again, you can see everybody kind of stays calm because they know as soon as we get this decompressed, he's going to come back. And that's exactly what happened. They're starting to get the paddles ready here. You see they've gone through it. And, and, and the surgeon's using a knife to get into the pericardium. Again, it's bulging at you. You can't just grab it with the bakeys and met some bombs and do it in a, in a controlled manner. you got to use, use a knife and just slowly uh, extend that. And again, you can see now they're extending the pericardiotomy and delivering the heart. Uh, and as soon as they release the cardiac tamponade, heart starts beating again. 
uh, and the patient was saved. He actually walked out of the hospital four days later. So these are really fun injuries to take care of. Uh, yeah, you see here, again, stab them right there, right ventricle, which is where normally typically where they are. They're not using pledges, as you can see. Again, obviously sticking their, their finger in the hole to stop some of the bleeding and they throw a uh, figure of eight. We threw two of those, bleeding stopped. And like I said, the patient went home uh, a couple days later. Flip that plate for a second on. Pretty cool. These patients always do great. Again, it's a lot better for a patient to have an obstructive phenomenon than, than to have a hemorrhagic shock phenomenon, right? It's a lot harder to get those patients back, but this is one of the better injuries to have. You see, you get no pledges, do a figure of eight, gentle as you're tying the, the knots down. Obviously, you don't want them to tear through. So nice and easy when you're coming down on the knots. And then you got a safe patient. Pretty cool. Uh, this is just pictorial representation of posterior injuries. These can be really challenging because as you manipulate the heart, they can start sending them arrhythmias. Uh, you can use lap pads to pack sequentially down behind the heart to help elevate it to get to where you need to go. Again, this is just showing the stitch that Dr. Griswold uh, would use, you can use a non-crushing clamp to help uh, try to elevate the heart. But those can be tricky because of the arrhythmias that, that occur when you're manipulating it. It's a horizontal mattress suture, which is what's recommended around the coronary vessel. So you can see here, stab wounds here, coronary vessels here, and they've done a horizontal mattress and they get ready to tie on this side. So again, if I'm that close to a vessel, normally I'll just say, especially if we can put our finger on it and control it, I usually will bring over uh, the cardiac people, you know, just to ensure that uh, we got enough space here and we're not going to tie that thing off because, again, big, big problems if you do. Um, this is a great paper from our own institution, published the American, Journal, uh, uh, the American Surgeon, which, of course, Dr. Richardson was the editor-in-chief of, uh, by Dr. Miller. And it basically looked at the, time, the, the history of mediastinal gunshot wounds at our institution. Uh, again, got the early versus the late. A couple interesting findings uh, uh, really were that cardiac injuries uh, – were more survivable back in the day, and that makes sense, right? The lethality the, the, of the weaponry was uh, uh, a lot less, not as much force, et cetera. Uh, and now, uh, again, a lot, lot, lot higher likelihood of death if it hits the heart. Um, we do operate more on the um, on the uh, peripheral wounds. Usually they cause lung bleeding, et cetera. And so that is uh, a little bit better for us as far as we get to, we get to operate in the chest more. Um, another cool picture from, from that uh, uh, manuscript that they keep the, uh, did uh, again. If you get a cardiac wound, you know, gunshot wound in the in the box, it, it's a big problem, right? So this is the lethality of, of that. You know, usually those patients do not make it. Um, a similar study uh, published out of Grady, just a lot more robust numbers. Again, they they see a little bit more of this with them being a lot bigger city. Uh, and this is over a thirty year period. There, just some cool facts. Same same thing basically. So stab wounds have gone down uh, in overall incidents. Gunshot wounds have gone up. Um, the way we diagnose them now, obviously very different. They used to form, you know, perform pericardial synthesis in all windows. And now we do basically all fast. So pretty cool, uh, to, uh, you know, again, a lot less invasive way of, of diagnosing the problem. And again, mortality, again, just to show you gunshot wounds, obviously not as good over time, um, a lot more, uh, lethal weaponry, uh, stab wounds have stayed about the same as far as mortality, which makes sense. All right. Last but not least, we got. Several more minutes. So we're going to talk about pulmonary embolism. And this is more of a late complication in our trauma patients. Usually can happen uh, day two to five uh, and cause big problems for you when you're not prepared. Um, again, overall incidence is a little bit variable in the trauma population and the and the symptoms with which they present with uh, are, are highly variable. That's why it's always important to maintain a high index of suspicion uh, for this pathology, because if you don't think about it, you obviously won't treat it and it, it, it may lead to the death of your patient. Chest x-rays are notoriously nonspecific. Uh, two signs that you all should know, Western Mark and, and Hampton's pump. I don't think they're very uh, uh, helpful at all. They're just more historic. Uh, and they were talked about in the 1930s uh, uh, from that perspective. CT pulmonary angiogram is really the gold standard of making the diagnosis nowadays. The big problem is when your patients are too unstable and hypoxic to move down there to have that, you know, what do you do next? And that's where these biomarkers uh, and an echocardiogram can really help guide your treatment strategy of, of, of what to do. Uh, it's the third most common cause uh, of cardiovascular mortality behind MI and stroke. And again, if it happens to your trauma patients, the, the risk of death is, is real. It's just a CT scan showing big saddle uh, pulmonary embolism that you never want to see. Um, this is just a Western Mark sign. So this is that. You can see the, the lung right here is a little bit hyperlucent. Uh, from vasoconstriction, you can see there's pulmonary vasculature markings over here. This is from a PE. Uh, in the upper lobe there. And this is just uh, basically uh, infarcted lung uh, was, was Hampton's home. So uh, you'll see that historically again, 
it, I think it's very non specific in most of our trauma patients. I apologize a little bit for the busy slide. This is just to show all the things that, that go into, you know, when you, when you have a, a trauma patient that comes in to developing a PE. This is why we talk a lot about DBT prophylaxis and, and the like, because again, right away, the, the inflammatory cascade is getting revved up uh, and increasing the risk of this happening to your patients. Um, and again, the local information is probably a big deal as well. And this has often been underreported. You know, patients can have uh, obviously uh, a vascular injury to the pulmonary arteries themselves, which, which can propagate clot. So keep that in mind. It's not just, you know, broken bone, laying in bed, uh, developing clot. Uh, this is a great study by Dr. Coleman, uh, Dr. Coleman uh, at, at, when she was in Denver uh, with other institutions, about 55,000 trauma patients that they looked at. And basically they wanted to say, okay, let's take out the early, let's take the early PEs and, and compare them to late PEs and see if we can find any risk factors associated with those. So again, pretty rare diagnosis overall, luckily. Uh, most of the time it was diagnosed with uh, uh, a CTPA, um, about 42 patients, uh, excuse me, 42 percent of patients. So that's, again, within the first three days, that's quite a few that have early PE. Uh, and they try to figure out, OK, well, what's what's the real major risk factor? And they in this study came up with long bones and extremity scores was after logistical regression was the main problem in the late PE group. The other things that you typically think about, again, immobile patients from severe TBI or spinal cord injury. And also they found that early blood transfusions were, were uh, a risk factor as well. And again, at the end of the paper, they say, you know, all these PEs probably aren't preventable. Um, and I'll show you that that's probably true. Uh, they did not find, with some more data, uh, they did not find that chest, chest injury score was associated, uh, was an independent predictor of uh, early PE, but several other uh, uh, studies done since this uh, have started to find correlation. So I think with time, especially as you get more numbers in that PE group, uh, chest injury will be important in that in that process. Um, it's just a pictorial as far as overall uh, PE uh, presentation and treatment. Again, mainstay is therapeutic anticoagulation. Once that is done, you really want to start assessing the patient's hemodynamics. Uh, once the diagnosis or the or the threat of the diagnosis is done, you want to start assessing the patient's hemodynamics. And again, I really want to focus most on this high risk uh, while we got a little bit more time. Um, this is just a, a, a simplified PE severity index. This is a way to try to delineate who you think is going to do worse uh, from PEs. Again, not a perfect scoring system, but just something to think about. Uh, age, chronic uh, COPD, cancer, uh, and the like are all possibilities to increase your score. But again, at the end of the day, I want to uh, talk about this high-risk PE presentation. So when patients are extremely hypotensive uh, from having a pulmonary embolism and profoundly hypoxic. Because these are difficult diagnosis in some of our uh, trauma patients up there because we simply can't move them to try to uh, uh, make a definitive diagnosis. And you still got to obviously help try to help treat the patient in the interim. Um, so it's, it's really important to trust your gut in these censuses. And again, don't forget uh, about its possibility. Uh, BMP levels can be important. They are very specific for ventricular strain. So it's good to send those and getting a 2D echo at the bedside. Uh, a lot of times that'll show right heart strain if there's a big enough uh, PE causing it. Uh, and again, it can start uh, tailoring your management. Um, when this happens, and I'm really worried about it, immediately call whatever interventionist at your hospital performs uh, uh, the debulking procedures. Again, I just call Dr. Davidi uh, or whoever's on vascular, and he points me to where I need to go, whoever's on, et cetera, for that day. Know that cardiologists and interventionists also do that. That's why I did you know, the interventionist tag here, because a lot of different people in the hospital do do this. But again, I think Dr. Davidi and our crew are, are the best at it. Um, Sorry. I put thrombolysis on here because you can give TPA. I Again, most of our patients are absolute contraindications to doing that. Uh, so I just put that, you know, really, this is going to be small town ERs that have no other way to intervene on the patient and they're worried about this or have diagnosis happening or who are going to be giving those medicines. Uh, we will not be giving them here. Um, again, there's a lot of bleeding risk. I'm sorry, this is blanked again by this thing, but, uh, you know, five times risk of extracranial hemorrhage and a 10 time risk of uh, a hemorrhagic stroke. So be careful with uh, delivering those medicines. And that's why most of the time we use catheter directed therapy when we're doing our embolectomies here. Um, most of the time, I thought to talk to Vidi about this, we use the flow retriever, which must be a dog lover that came up with that name, obviously, for, uh, I think it's fantastic. Um, you put these uh, through 24 French uh, catheters. Okay. So just for reference for the residents, a seven French catheter is a cordis. So this is a garden hose going into the femoral vein uh, to try to flush these clots out. So, uh, but again, very important, especially in patients that are hemodynamically unstable, get the interventionalist involved immediately. Uh, try to prove that this is going on after you've instituted anticoagulation. 
uh, and get the patient uh, eventually to an interventional suite so they can get this uh, uh, removed and save their life. Really important to get this done in the first two hours. Over 80% of deaths uh, occur in those first two hours. So you really want to get this done. Um, this is a surgical cap of mine up in the office. Uh, Dr. Neil Budiani, who's resident here and is at MD Anderson, a you know, big deal. Uh, he gave our whole team that we all had different names or whatever. Uh, he did the old hashtag DVT Pro Bro because the residents know I talk about DVT prophylaxis constantly. It's a very high area of litigation for us, even though the data is crap, which we'll talk about in the in the Cochrane database. But you got to talk about this every day. Uh, and even though it doesn't necessarily, it does not prevent PEs, it does decrease the risk of DVTs. And you're going to, you can get sued on this, of course, at every turn. So it's really important to always talk about it. And, and more specifically, if you're not going to use DVT prophylaxis, say why. It's okay not to use it. You just need to say why in your daily note. Uh, and again, residents don't talk about this all the time. This is just the Cochrane database, explicitly written in a, one of the most beautiful documents in 2013. We find no evidence that thromboprophylaxis uh, re reduces primary outcome mortality or secondary outcome in PE. So again, we do a lot of stuff for this. It probably doesn't really help in, in, in decreasing fatal PE. It's kind of wild to think about. Um, all right, so conclusions. ATLS uh, you know, really needs to become second nature, and it will. Uh, the applicants that come, you'll be doing ATLS your, before residency even starts. So uh, it's a really important uh part of our uh, workup, uh, of course, for trauma patients, and, and you will be very good at it by the time you're done with your first year. Attractive shock, second most common reversal etiology, so be aware of it. Chest tubes, uh, um, pericardial windows, and, and of course, PE treatments are the mainstays. FAST is a huge uh, diagnostic uh, tool uh, in our armamentarium, so be good at it. And finally, you're almost always going to need friends for your uh, high-risk PE, so, so get them on the phone quickly so you can get your patient moved on to the next step. Um, and, and now I'll just take questions. I just want to shout public shout out to my wife, who's a really special person. She, um, I'm terrible at public speaking, so she always uh, uh, helps uh, helps me rehearse these uh, uh, prior to. It's our daughter Lucy uh, and Zoe, and of course our two pups, Doc and Kiki. So thank you all so much for your support. Well, uh, thank Dr. Nash. Great talk. We would disagree with you about your public speaking skills. Um, I have one question. Um, you know, every time I've given an oral exam to students over the last 30 years, uh, when presented with a pneumothorax, they stick a needle or a catheter in the, in the chest. And when they have a, a cardiac tamponade or suspected, they stick a needle into the heart to occur cardiac uh, So for the same reason that on my service, uh, all uh, knots in the operating room are tied with the, with, uh, the resident's hands because we're, we're not ER doctors. Uh, why is it uh, maybe a better idea that uh, in the trauma on the trauma service in room nine that they're not sticking needles in these things? Yes. Yeah, so uh, again, the problem is is, is angiocatheters and other things. Sometimes you, uh, you you don't most of the time they don't even get into the chest. So if you look at pre-hospital providers and they and they of course place angiocath to try to decompress you know an unstable patient, about seventy five percent of the time they don't even enter into the chest at all. So and, and on top of that, it's a blind stick, right? A lot of important blood vessels, of course, the heart. You don't want to just you know, be doing these things blindly. So it's a, it's a lot safer method, actually, for the patient to be putting in uh, tubes. Pericardial synthesis is the same way. Again, if you're in the middle of nowhere and, and you don't know how to do an ethorchotomy or anything like that, you know, doing pericardial synthesis may save someone's life, but it's not the easiest thing to do. And it's just a blind stick at the end of the day. You can use ultrasound and whatnot, but it's blind, right? And so uh, here or any other major level of trauma center, you really need to just go up and decompress the chest and not just randomly be sticking the needles. So. Other questions, comments? Dr. Ben? Yeah, great talk. I uh, appreciate a lot of great overview, a lot of things. I guess you mentioned your talk by nature and sort of focusing on the chest and chest trauma. I'm just curious, as we go around the country, it seems the general trend is surgeons are becoming more and more narrow in the scope of practice. So, who should be taking care of chest trauma and what do you feel is the ideal interaction with cardiothoracic subspecialists? Yeah, fantastic question. And, and again, this is vestiges of, of uh, uh, Dr. Richardson himself there. Uh, you know, he always made it a, a big part of things to, to not um, 
you know, to, to be the most well-rounded surgeon physician that you can be. And, and again, if you let everybody else do those procedures, then you lose that, uh, those capabilities. And so he, he was always proud himself on being able to do a little bit of everything. And that's why that, you know, he published the paper on, uh, on us doing our own VAT. So again, as a resident snow, we do all of our own, uh, uh stuff here, whether it's vascular surgery front in the proximal limbs, uh, thoracic, cardiac, et cetera. And we also know that we, we always have a helping hand if we're having any issue or, or, we, you know, it's a little bit more than we can handle. I think we know what we don't know, but it is important for the residents. And, and of course the applicants to know that, that we, we like to do all of our own things. And, and, uh, cause if you don't practice it, then you won't do it long-term. So really, really important. All right. Well, our uh, time has expired. As the applicants, some might find out, we uh, usually start and end our conferences on time. We can take a very quick five minute break. You'll get yourself a pastry and a cup of coffee, and we'll reconvene for a few hours. Thanks, Dr. Nash. Great talk. Thanks, sir.